I'm Deanne Erdman with Baylor College of Medicine's Options Program. Ecological studies depend on combinations of observation. This section deals with populations, what makes a population, um, how they grow, remain stable, and how they decline. A group of organisms of the same species living in an area at, at the same time is how we define a population. And the boundaries sometimes are sharp, say the edge of a canyon or a specific defined body of water, enclosed body of water like a lake. Or more often, the boundaries may be a little bit blended. Some examples of populations might be um, the bacteria living in the, the gut of, of a human, um, all of the red fish uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, all of the bass uh, in a lake. Now, uh, if I were talking about, say, the fish within a lake, and we had populations of perch and catfish and bass, each one of those is a, sepa is a separate population. So fish as a group are not a population, but each particular species is a population. Uh, the humans worldwide can be considered a population. So you can talk about populations on a small scale or a large scale. Some key characteristics in looking at populations are the dispersion patterns, population density, and the growth rate. Three common uh, patterns of population distribution. As you take a look at the diagram, the first one is, is pretty obvious. It's clumped. This is the most common. Um, in, in this particular example, I think we're using minnows or, or fish, and uh, they can clump together for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's for reproduction, sometimes it's for protection or extra awareness of, of uh, other predators that might be in their environment. Sometimes they're clumped because of available resources are located in a certain area. Uniform dispersion uh, usually indicates some kind of territoriality. Uh, some kind of d aggressive defense of that. Or it could be that the resources are spread out and, and are sparse. And so uh, organisms have to space them out in order to get enough resources. On, on a sort of a, uh, a not, not too scientific scale, you might even notice uh, this uniform distribution of hawks when you're just driving along the highway. Uh, as, as I've driven along before, I maybe see a hawk in, in a tree and then at about regular distances or intervals, I'll see another hawk. And then as we continue on, then another one. And they do seem to be spaced out. You may have uh, looked upon a telephone wire before and seen birds that are, are clustered and notice that it looks like somebody's lying them up in perfect order. And even if you watch for a little bit and see a new bird come into the uh, to, to roost or to, to perch, they won't just crowd in any place. They crowd in where that spacing is, is uh, uh, going to be uniform, and they even kind of move along and, and space themselves out if somebody does uh, miss the mark and crowd in a little bit. The uh, least common of the, of the dispersion patterns are, is random. Uh, occasionally, you may find trees in the tropical rainforest that are this way. Um, maybe dandelions. Usually resources are abundant and uh, they d the, uh, the, the distribution of them doesn't have much effect on where the organisms are located. Population density is determined by measuring the population in some designated area. And these population densities can depend on interactions with their environment the quality of the habitat, whether it's uh, rich and abundant or whether it's sparse, the carrying capacity of the environment, and then density dependent and density independent factors. We're going to talk about density dependent and density independent factors in a little bit more detail on, in a later slide, but, but this is, I think, is the first time we've introduced the word carrying capacity, so let's take a look at that. The carrying capacity is the maximum number of uh, organisms that a particular habitat can support. And you can think or, or realize that this includes a lot of factors, not just how many uh, other, uh, other organisms of the same type there are, but w what the food supply is, what the predators are, what the climate is like, etc. Population densities can be measured by several different sampling techniques. One, uh, and of course, when you're out in the field, it's not quite as easy as when uh, you're in the laboratory situation. So if you had um, a, a number of miles 
or a number of acres of uh, territory to cover, you might grid that off and count each grid and then put those together. Or if it, w if it were hundreds of miles, you might even select random grids, do a count in those and extrapolate what you think the population, or estimate what you think the population might be. Another method that ecologists use is the mark and recapture method. And in this uh, case, you have to assume, of course, that there's no births or deaths, that there's no immigration or emigration, but you uh, uh, capture your first um, set of organisms and you mark them, and then you come back at a later time and see how many of those marked um, you recapture. And you compare that with the, the total number that you, you capture in your second uh, attempt. Of course, some things can, inter, um, can influence this. Sometimes uh, the animal becomes more wary of the capture process, so you have to take some of that into account also. But that's just several techniques. Let's look at population growth rate. Two of the biggest factors that influence population growth rate are birth rates and death rates. We're going to look at the per capita growth rate uh, in the population. And so the first thing we consider is our birth rate minus our death rate plus any organisms that enter or leave the area, the immigrations versus the emigrations. Once we've determined that, uh, if we're looking at an idealized population's biotic potential, you can see that it takes the form of an exponential growth curve, which is the form, which is the shape of a J. And uh, in order to determine what this uh, uh, population's biotic potential is, we're going to look at the change in the population size, which is represented by N, uh, divided by the change in time that that occurs in, and that gives us our biotic potential. Of course, in this particular case, this can't be sustained for forever because resources aren't unlimited and there are other factors in the population. So a much more realistic curve is the logistical curve, or the S-shaped curve, and what you've, what you've done to change the equation in this particular instance is you've added in the pressure of carrying capacity. And carrying capacity, of course, are all those factors in the habitat, uh, the amount of food, the amount of water, nesting space, available mates, um, temperature, other um, organisms that influence and are sharing the same habitat. In this particular um, model, we see that we have a carrying capacity of 1,000. When we look and study uh, age structure in populations, uh, survivorship curves are very useful. And what we're looking at is the percentage of the original population, so the original population, that survives to a given age. And one of the first things that I, that I would point out on this particular graph is the x-axis. Notice that that's not the total uh, lifespan in years, that's a percentage because, of course, these three different organisms don't have the same kind of lifespan. So as we're comparing them, we need to take that into consideration. Organisms that exhibit a type 1 growth curve, uh, humans would be an example of that. They have a low death rate in early um, development and through the, the middle part of the lifespan with a faster die-off rate towards the end. In uh, organisms that exhibit a type 2 curve have a fairly even uh, death rate throughout their lifespan. And we're if showing this with birds or, uh, or a sample of this, squirrels are a sample of this uh, type growth curve. And then growth curve type 3 has a high mortality early on uh, that levels off. And uh, fish are an example of this particular uh, growth curve. A lot of invertebrate um, uh, animals as well have this kind. When we're thinking about population growth, we want to look at reproductive strategies. And we, we've mentioned and talked before about reproduction uh, has a tremendous metabolic cost. So you always have to outweigh how much energy you're expending on the reproductive effort for your, for your maximum return. And there are organisms that uh, kind of practice several strategies, uh, sometimes called an R-selected strategy or a K-selected strategy. And you can see a comparison of uh, how an organism might go about this. And so this is a variation on the logistical uh, equation. As you take a look at the R-selected, this is a maximum growth rate. They're producing, uh, they reproduce very early, they have a short lifespan, 
Um, they produce a, a, usually a large number of offspring at a time, but they have a high mortality rate, and they often operate below the carrying capacity. Bony fish are an example of uh, organisms that have an R-selected reproductive strategy. Grasshoppers have an R-selected reproductive strategy. When you look at the K-selected, this is where we're going to you're going to find in general that the population maximizes near the upper limits of its environment so it's very much influenced by carrying capacity. Uh, reproduction usually occurs later, takes longer to mature to reproduce, a much longer lifespan, low mortality rates, and notice extensive uh, parental care. And over when we looked at the R selected, there's not much parental care if any. The, the, the eggs are laid and the, um, the organism takes off. And, and so that's why there have to be so many. But in the case of more parental involvement or more parental care, then you're going to get a higher survival rate so you can invest less energy in the number that you're reproducing. Uh, elephants are an example of this, sharks. And of course, we're a K-selected uh, type of an organism. Well, we said that we defined carrying capacity as the maximum number that an, an environment can support. So as densities increase, competitions increase, and so we have uh, some limits that are set. Density dependent limits and some density independent limits. Things that uh, uh, are regulated by the, the, the higher densities. Of course, when you have more organisms in your population, then food supply, water, shelter, availability of mates, disease are all uh, factors that increase as density increases. Density independent limits um, uh, uh, the overall growth of a population. It doesn't really matter how big or how small the population is. These things are, are going to affect it and that's the weather. If you have extremely good weather or bad weather, if you have a catastrophic event, the climate, etc. So uh, uh, you can see that we've, we've got two different kinds of factors going here. I think it's interesting to mention boom or bust cycles. Uh, I, the, the snowshoe hare and the lynx have been studied since the um, early 1820s, and this population that lives in northern Canada and Alaska is a great, popula is a great population to study when you're, or to illustrate when you're talking about boom or bust cycles. In this case, the snowshoe hare uh, uh, favorite food is our branches of the willow and the birch. And so as these are in abundance, the snowshoe hare has a lot of food to eat and its populations increase. And usually this is over a several year cycle. As their population increase, then the lynx population, which feeds uh, pretty predominantly on the snowshoe hare, then those populations begin to uh, increase. So, so what does it do to the overall effect? Well, as the snowshoe hare's population increases, then the willow and the, and the birch twigs begin to decrease, uh, causing them to have less food, which can cause their population to decline. At the same time, with their high population numbers, the lynx population has had lots to eat, and its population has been increasing. Um, as the snowshoe hare decreases because uh, it's overgrazed its territory, uh, then the, the numbers of the lynx will decrease because of the population. So we seem to follow these cycles of organisms. And you can see it's not just because of uh, overpredation by the lynx. Uh, it also has to do with the predation of the, the snowshoe hare on the birch twigs. Remember, uh, all population studies center, center around interaction with other members of, of the same population, with other populations, and with the environment.